This protocol review is about the most common CT examination, the routine CT head. So why do we perform CT head scans? There are a few common indications. Initial evaluation of stroke, headache, vertigo, seizures, and there are several other reasons that we would perform a CT of the head without contrast. There's only a few reasons that we would perform a CT scan of the head with contrast. There's also a specific way that we should perform a CT head scan. The scan type is generally going to be the axial mode at most institutions. This gives us more spatial resolution and also minimizes the effect of helical artifact. Occasionally, you will find institutions that use the helical scan. The benefit of this is increased post-processing options. So what kind of slice parameters should we use? Again, this varies between institutions. At many places, they will use thinner slices through the posterior fossa and thicker slices through the vertex. The thin slices through the base of the skull are often performed with 2.5 millimeter thickness. These thinner slices allow for increased spatial resolution. 5 millimeter slices are completed through the vertex. The thin slices through the base of the skull are often performed with 1.5 millimeter thickness. These thinner slices allow for increased spatial resolution. 5 millimeter slices are completed through the vertex. This does decrease the spatial resolution, but it also allows for less image noise. Here's an example of what that looks like. Through the base of the skull, 2.5 millimeter thick slices are preferred. When you look at the mastoid air cells and the other structures of the base of the cranium, it is helpful to see increased detail even if that does increase the image noise. When we look at the five millimeter slices, these slices are thicker, therefore they have less spatial resolution, but they also have less image noise. And this is acceptable in the upper portions of the cranium where bony detail is not as essential. Other things do need to be considered when completing a routine CT head. For example, the gantry tilt. Not all CT procedures require that the gantry be tilted, but in this case, the gantry should be tilted so that the slices are aligned parallel to the supraorbital meatal line. And the specific purpose of this is to avoid the lens of the eye. In this image, the technologist did not angle correctly. And there's a few things that we can see. First, the very bright artifact across the bridge of the nose is actually a bismuth eye shield. Below the bismuth eye shield, you can see the eyes, and the lens of the eye is clearly seen. This means that the technologist did not angle correctly to the supraorbital meatal line and did not avoid the lens of the eye. Whether or not to use contrast in a routine CT head scan is something that needs to be considered very carefully. Almost all indications for a CT head do not require contrast. Things like trauma, stroke, seizures, and most other indications should be performed without contrast. The only time that with contrast scans are preferred for CT imaging of the head is when we're looking at tumors. However, there is one caveat on that. CT scanning of the head without and with contrast should only be performed for tumors and only when MRI is contraindicated. As much as I hate to admit it, MRI imaging is the preferred modality for tumor and lesion imaging inside of the brain. If MRI is contraindicated, then CT of the head should be performed without contrast first and then next with contrast. There's a very specific reason that we do that. If you look at these three images, some of these images were performed without contrast, and one of these images was performed with contrast. If you'll notice though, in all three images of the brain, we have certain areas that are clearly very bright, much brighter than the surrounding brain tissues. So how do we know 
if the patient received contrast or didn't receive contrast? How do we know what a brain bleed is compared to a contrast-enhancing tumor? The first image was performed without contrast, and the bright areas are intracranial bleeds. The second image was also performed without contrast, and the bright area, again, is an intracranial bleed. When a CT head is performed without contrast, brain bleeds appear as bright white. And that can be confusing, because when a CT of the head is performed with contrast, tumors also appear as bright white. So it's very important that when we are imaging tumors, that we first scan without contrast to identify bleeding, and then scan with contrast to help define the borders of tumors. These two images together provide an example of that. The first image at the left was scanned without contrast. There is clearly a metastatic lesion, but the borders of those lesions are not clearly defined. What we can see, though, is that there's no bleeding. If we look at the image to the right, the same patient was scanned at the same time with contrast, and now the borders of the tumor are clearly defined. If we had scanned with contrast immediately, it might have been difficult to tell if this was an enhancing tumor or if this was a bleeding tumor. There's a few more things that need to be taken into consideration. A CT head should be performed with the standard algorithm as well as the bone algorithm. And this is valuable for some specific reasons. In these two images, we're looking at the bony areas of the base of the cranium. This is the same slice with the same slice thickness. The image at the left was completed with the standard algorithm. The image at the right was completed with the bone algorithm. As you can see, the standard algorithm does not represent bony structures very well. It's a smoothing filter. The bone algorithm at the right, however, does give us very crisp, high spatial resolution images of the bone. If we look at the brain tissues inside of the patient's cranium, we can see why it definitely is valuable to still perform a standard algorithm reconstruction. The image to the left was completed with the standard algorithm. The soft tissues of the brain are smooth and clearly distinguished from one another. There's really very little image noise. But when we look at the image to the right, this is the same patient, same slice, same scan, but this time the image was reconstructed with the bone algorithm. There's a significant amount of image noise which obscures a significant amount of the brain tissue. And this is why it's beneficial to complete the scan with both a standard algorithm and a bone algorithm so that we can see the soft tissues of the brain in the standard algorithm and the bony structures of the cranial cavity with the bone algorithm. It's also important that we represent these images correctly with the right window width and window level. Standard algorithm images should have an 80 window width and a 30 window level. The 80 window width provides for increased contrast because it's a narrow window width, and the 30 window level corresponds approximately to the Hounsfield units of the brain tissue. The bony algorithm images should be displayed with a much larger window width, 2,500 window width, and a window level that approximately corresponds to the Hounsfield units of bone, which is about 600. And when we represent these correctly, it clearly displays very different structures inside of the brain. The image to the left is a bone algorithm in the bone window width and window level, and this shows us a fracture in the parietal bone of the brain. The same slice on the right was reconstructed with a standard algorithm and displayed with an 80 window width and a 30 window level, and this doesn't show us the fracture in the parietal bone, but it does show us an epidural hematoma at the level of the parietal lobe in the same area where the fracture was. So that's why it's important that the brain is reconstructed with both standard and bone algorithms and displayed correctly.